I am now pleased to introduce Brigitte Poiker. Am I pronouncing it right? It's fine. <laughs> Brigitte Poiker is the Elias Leavenworth Professor of Germanic Languages and Literatures and Professor of Film Studies at Yale University. Her books include Lyric Descent in the German Romantic Tradition, Incorporating Images, Film and the Rival Arts, and The Material Image, Art and the Real in Film. Professor Poiker is currently working on a book about Fassbinder. Professor Poiker will, in, will moderate this panel and introduce the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, again, and it's been wonderful being able to participate in some of your events. And I'd like to begin by re, well, not introducing, but calling everyone's attention to Ed Nersessian, who is, of course, the co-director of the center and who is uh, participating on this panel. Um, as you know, he's a professor of psychiatry and he teaches at the Cornell Wild Medical Center and also, of course, at the uh, New York Psychoanalytic um, Institute. He's a training analyst. To his right, across from me, is Thomas Elsesser, who is a professor, a research professor at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He has written extensively on cinema, in particular on German cinema. He has a book on Fassbinder called uh, Fassbinder's Germany. He has a book on Weimar cinema, on um, the new German cinema uh, in general. He has a book on Metropolis through the BFI series, and he also has a new book on uh, Hollywood, contemporary Hollywood cinema. And uh, to Ed's left over here is Wayne Kestenbaum, who is a professor of English at the CUNY Graduate Center. He has uh, written extensively on uh, matters of, well, really all the arts. He's written a book called Double Talk uh, on the erotics of male literary collaboration. He's written a book on, he's written on Warhol, I think it's a book. Uh, his other uh, book is called The Queen's Throat and it's about opera. Uh, and I should also add that he is a very talented a uh, well-published poet. Uh, he also uh, teaches in the art school at Yale. Um, uh, so he is a person of many talents. Um, Leo Lensing is to my right. He's a professor of German studies at Wesleyan. Uh, he's written a book on Rabe, a 19th century German realist. He is at work on the definitive work, I'm certain, uh, on Karl Kraus. Uh, and it's going to be a huge biography, uh, really good, I'm certain too. Uh, he has, he's uh, just finished a book on Peter Altenberg, the Viennese visual artist. And he is the editor of an anthology of essays on Fassbinder. Um, I'll just say a couple of words. I think we're all going to be intersecting. We'll all approach the film in different ways, but it's impossible really not to have all approaches intersect um, with a film such as this one. I'll only say a couple of words. One is um, that, or to begin with, I hope to say more later, but to begin with that, um, this has certain autobiographical dimensions. Fassbinder's uh, lover, Armin Meyer, committed suicide on Fassbinder's birthday in their, uh, the, the apartment they both lived in together. Um, this, of course, was something that uh, shocked Fassbinder. Uh, and it drew a lot of uh, public attention. And Fassbinder, as a result, said, well, there are only, I only have three alternatives. I can go to Paraguay, you know, just choosing any place exotic out of a hat. I can lock myself in my apartment and, uh, and, and give in to my depression, or I can make a movie. And so this is one of the reasons I think a text such as this one really um, 
is the kind of thing that the center might be interested in. But I think, let me, um, I don't know who would like to begin. Maybe Leo, uh, you'd like to begin with a, 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 a few words. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I should say, I teach um, a number of Fassbinder films every year in a course on the New German Cinema, and I've never taught this one before. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I will anytime soon, but I have to say that the experience of uh, seeing it uh, recently on DVD and together with you today uh, has made the film um, uh, come alive to me in ways that I cannot remember. I saw it in 1978 when it first came out in Germany. Uh, I frankly was mystified by the film. I had a, uh, I had a hard time separating the, the many voices that we were trying to, uh, to hear and to read through the uh, uh, through the subtitles tonight was, was a problem when I first saw the film. Um, having taught German cinema now for 20 plus years and seen many Fassbinder films repeatedly, I, I have more, I think, of a sense of what is going on in this film. I wanted to throw out an idea that, that may not have occurred to, uh, to all of us seeing the film the first time, but it's something that really has pressed itself on my viewing of the film, and that is the, uh, the character of Anton Seitz, uh, this uh, uh, Jewish man who as a boy uh, was in a concentration camp, survived it, and, and came out and uh, made a life for himself. He was going to come to the United States. God knows what would have happened to him or to the United States if he had actually made it here. Uh, but he stays in Frankfurt, and I, I think uh, uh, at some point, in a, not in the film itself, but in a text about the film, uh, Anton Seitz says, it turns out Frankfurt is not that different from America anyway. It's the same kind of sort of capitalist. Uh, uh, for him, it's a kind of capitalist playground. For others, a capitalist nightmare. Um, but what interests me is uh, in, in this, it's not only in this film, it's in other films. Fassbinder has uh, created Jewish characters. Uh, I think Thomas L. Sesser says this in his book, but it would be apparent to anyone who had seen a broad spectrum of films of the New German Cinema. There are very few Jewish characters in these films. They almost never appear. Uh, if they do, it's, in a, it's almost in a very sort of broad, caricatured way, so often philo-Semitic. Uh, philo uh, but in any case, uh, characters who are um, who seem to be either cardboard or caricatured, uh, either in a positive, uh, usually in a positive way, obviously not often in a negative way. Um, seeing this film again, I asked myself, what is this, why is Anton Seitz Jewish? Uh, why is Fassbinder, in a sense, piling complexity upon complexity, using uh, a transsexual, a, a man who's become a woman as the central character, and then having him uh, fall in love with this man uh, who has this kind of history. And I wanted to throw that out as a kind, as a kind of question to all of us. Uh, I know that uh, Thomas has thought about this, uh, this problem and, and has written about it, but I, um, I think it's worth talking about in terms of the film and maybe comparatively as well. You want me to come in on this straight away? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm actually very grateful for this opportunity to re-see the film because I haven't seen it for a good 15, 18 years and when I wrote about it in around about 19, 1992, 93, um, I was very much aware that this is one of the most uh, difficult films to talk about in, in Fassbinder's work and since my book was primarily not a, a biography of Fassbinder, it was also not exactly a book that wanted to place him in film studies or film history, but very deliberately chose Fassbinder's relation with West Germany, with uh, post-war Germany. Uh, my attention, of course, was drawn to some of uh, the features that uh, Leo just mentioned, but maybe we should, we should add another historical context. Uh, Brigitte has already indicated that there's a strong autobiographical dimension. And um, there are two things that, that probably are worth adding to that. One is that with the death of Armin Meyer in their Munich apartment, the, uh, the latent hostility or ambivalence towards Fassbinder in Germany really broke out into the open. And um, the press was extremely hostile, very shrill. There were calls for investigating whether Fassbinder had made himself guilty of negligence. There were even questions of crim criminal prosecution 
of uh, Fassbinder. So the fact that in his apartment somebody killed himself became a major scandal. Now, of course, looking back on it, it is interesting, or at least it's ironic and maybe tragic, that Fassbinder himself died in his own apartment, in the very same apartment where Armin Meyer died. And uh, uh, some of you may know a film called Germany and Autumn, where there is actually a scene. Uh, it's, a, it's an omnibus film, several episodes, and the one by Fassbinder is actually very quote-unquote autobiographical because it's set in his apartment. Uh, Armin Meyer plays a major role in it. The mother, Lilo Pempite, whom we see as, as the nun, as uh, Sister Gertrude in the film, is also present. It's a, it's a chamber piece of three, three characters with Ingrid Kaven on the end of a telephone line. So quite a few, this is a film from 1977, so the year before, so quite a few of the constellations that are in Germany in autumn reappear in, in the film we saw just now. So that's another kind of intertextual relationship that one might add. But I think uh, the temptation is to see the film very autobiographical. And of course, it is useful, certainly in this context here, also to think about whether the film constitutes a form of morning work. In other words, whether it's an attempt to come to terms, to work through feelings of depression, but also feelings of guilt. But it's problematized by the fact that the guilt is not something that Fassbender was allowed to feel himself. It was put upon him. In other words, he had to come to terms with the fact that others said, don't you feel guilty? And of course, we know that is a, a kind of demand made on you that the first response is to say, no, I'm not. And of course, that, once we think that through, we see immediately how it relates to your question, namely the post-war relationship between Germans and Jews. Or if we should say Germans in inverted commas and Jews in inverted commas, because the Jews in Germany were also Germans. In fact, that's what they primarily were before they had to learn to be separate from the rest of uh, the German community. So that relationship, who are you in relation to the guilt that's being put upon you, your sense of responsibility, uh, was a question writ large in West Germany since 45, and was it very many times disavowed, disowned, rejected, uh, overcompensated. You mentioned philo-Semitism as a kind of overcompensation of an anti-Semitism that was never fully discussed or analyzed. So there we already begin to see some of those complications and that those layering of the film in terms of uh, its, um, its historical references. But there's another one that uh, struck me this time more strongly than before, and that is that Frankfurt is very much, not just happens to be the setting of the film, but very much a reference point in the film. And it's a reference <coughs> point in, in several ways. First of all, uh, although Fassbinder is primarily associated with Munich, and you may recall there's a little debate, should uh, uh, the daughter study in France, say in Frankfurt or study in Munich. Um, what, we, what is probably useful to know, and certainly would have been known to the audiences in, in, uh, in 78, is that Fassbinder worked as a theater director in Frankfurt. Um, Fassbinder had several careers, as it were, uh, and one of them was as a quite successful theater director. And this episode of Fassbinder as a theater director uh, ended under rather um, difficult circumstances, not to say under scandalous circumstances, because uh, one of the plays that he actually wrote for uh, the Frankfurt Theatre, Theater am Turm, was called City, Garbage and Death, uh, which dealt with several key issues of the time, one of them being, I mean, as you, well, there are two other things. One is that, of course, Frankfurt is the traditional city of Jewish culture. One of the great centers of Jewish culture in Germany before the war was Frankfurt. Uh, and and uh, indeed, uh, if you go a little bit back or a little bit forward, uh, Jude Suess, the notorious film, is also about Frankfurt Jewry. So, so Frankfurt is completely overdetermined, is completely layered with these references. Now, um, the other thing is that Frankfurt was also one of the, uh, the key cities, first of all, Adorno and Harkheimer, the, the famous Frankfurt School, 
Jewish emigres coming back uh, into the university, in fact creating a culture, the culture of post-war Germany was very much determined by on the one hand Adorno, Horkheimer, Jewish exiles returning, on the other hand by a publishing house called Suhrkamp that also is located in Frankfurt. So uh, Frankfurt suddenly becomes a very, very <coughs> crucial point. It was also the, uh, the city of student revolt uh, of the 68, six apart from Berlin, it was Frankfurt. Daniel Kohn-Bendit, uh, famous character from uh, also uh, May 68 in, in France, came from Frankfurt. Uh, but also Frankfurt was a city and you, Leo also already mentioned it, which was actually thought of as being a boom town. It is the city of banks, and its, its name in the 70s was Manhattan. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you see, that's where the American reference is actually uh, already in, in the language. But to top all that, and this is where it becomes so tricky and delicate, is that uh, one of the main issues of the students had actually to do with property. And it had to do with squatting, with students, you know, it's a city that uh, housed 30 or 40,000 students all looking for cheap accommodation. And as the city became a boom town and banks uh, started building and demolishing uh, cheaper areas, a uh, well-known urban phenomenon, um, the pressure was on student housing, cheap housing, and those who actually were responsible, or th the students thought were responsible for knocking down houses, were the property developers. Now it happens that the most, or the best known, and probably one of the most powerful property developers, was a man called Ignaz Bubis, who was at that time uh, the head of the Jewish community in Frankfurt, and then became actually the head of the Jewish community in Germany. And it is elements of his autobiography from uh, Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen, I think it was, that find their way into the Anton Seitz figure so that anybody in Germany seeing the film at the time would have been only too aware of how close this Anton Seitz figure <laughs> seems to be to a historical living person. And it was the Frankfurt Jewish community that effectively banned or made sure that the, the, f the play, which also incorporates some of those elements, was banned and couldn't be shown. So we're immediately getting into this very strong Frankfurt subtext, but it's one that presumably for an international audience is of very little relevance. So we perhaps need to backtrack a little bit and look at the film in a yeah. slightly yeah. different way as well. I wonder if I um, could interject all of those things um, very much inform the film, and um, but it's at every moment in this film it never allows for easy <coughs> dichotomies, um, black and white, or guilt and lack of guilt. And if we could just backtrack for a moment uh, to go to Germany in autumn, where in fact it might very well be a text that would show. Fassbinder's guilt for his lover's death, the way he manipulates him there, the aggressiveness that he enacts against his lover suggests that very possibly, probably, and I would hope that he would feel, uh, would have felt a great deal of guilt um, for uh, that death, just as many Germans must feel, do feel a great deal of guilt vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust. Secondly, um, the question of Frankfurt, it's there, and yet it's always, almost every image is overlaid with another image. You get um, the interesting layering of textualities, the three kinds or four kinds of uh, uh, TV programs that you hear. You hear the, fa the interview with the, with the fascist or the program, the documentary about the fascist dictator Pinochet, which obviously has a real connection to uh, Hitler's Germany. You have Fassbinder's um, interview about his childhood. You only get snippets of that. It's not that there's a continuous narrative. And you have uh, melodramas about failed relationships in which 
emotional violence is enacted um, uh, uh, between different couples. Uh, but then you have the soundtrack, the, interv the documentary about Pinochet, which carries over to a very, very long tracking shot over the rooftops of Frankfurt, making the city present, it's real. Um, uh, but at that same moment in which we have this tracking shot, we have another filmic reference, um, lest you think that Frankfurt is about the uh, manipulation of the real estate market by uh, Bubats, you have the filmic memory of uh, the long pan of the rooftops of Nuremberg that Leni Riefenstahl uh, made so famous in Triumph of the Will. So I, I just want to say that at every moment there's something else that withdraws or that, that mitigates or that um, opposes uh, one kind of reading with another. As far as the identity of Zeitz is concerned, you hear about him, that he is, has manipulated everyone and that he's such a, uh, a terrible guy. But in fact, how do you see him? You see him enacting two kinds of films. He's reenacting um, a scene from a Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis film. And he takes the part of Jerry Lewis in all of his sort of abject um, uh, gesturing, his spastic body uh, movements. Um, he's by no means the manipulator in that scenario. The other movie scenario that governs his identity is the gangster film that uh, he and his henchmen, his you know, fellow workers, uh, and act daily, uh, the staging of the raid, the, um, the uh, 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 checking for weapons, the, uh, uh, there are various evidences of that. And for that, the code word is Bergen Belsen. So it's almost as though an evacuated identity has to be shored up, built up through through um, cinematic means, by assuming roles. That makes Anton Zeitz very much resemble um, Elvira, who also is someone with an evacuated identity. I just wanted to throw that in. Everything, I agree with everything you say, and yet there's also this. And that's what I find so interesting, actually, about this text, but I don't want to, um, Wayne, I know you wanted to talk about um, filmic references and intertextuality yeah, and the I look of the film. Three so, things. Um, this isn't my favorite Fassbinder film by any means. I had just been complaining before we started about how repulsed, I, w I mean, there's very obviously the slaughterhouse scene. It's very, um, I don't find a point of identification in it. And it's in almost all other, or let's say in three quarters of the Fassbinder films, there's a, a, a sight in it, whether visual or a, a character that I can put myself in and that leads, and that this film is, it, whether you say it's like Teflon or it just, it refuses it refuses my embrace, um, and so I, I don't like it. Um, I like it more after seeing it today with all of you. And so th I, th maybe there are three things I want to say. The first is, for me, the, the glory of Fassbinder is the intertextual use he made of his repertory players. The, the sort of if you to see one Fassbinder film isn't really to get it all because he repeats the same people re recur and that gossip. Um, the extra filmic, which is so important to Hollywood history, is equally important to Fassbinder's own reenacted simulacral Hollywood. That what went on, what we can, you know, the, the, the tattletale stars, what they said about their lives with Fassbinder becomes another text surrounding it that in, enriches it. For example, um, as others have pointed out, the woman who plays the nun is Fassbinder's mother. Try to find one film in American <laughs> film history where, and this is not the only film where he made use of his mother. So we we can say that symbolically, Sunset Boulevard was its director's morning work, but in this case, he actually used his mother, and that's a very different level of either acting out or um, 
a, a, a kind of existential decisiveness that you can not only replay your reality, but you can manipulate it through the people themselves. Ingrid Coven, who plays a red Zora, uh, like Zora Neale Hurston, are we meant to think? Yes. I don't know. Is was his what was Fassbinder's wife, kind of, um, and um, Fassbinder developed relations with various of his stars to fuck with the minds of other stars, and so that I think that Fassbinder's aggression um, toward his players is a major aspect of the film. So in a, in a sense, it's whether it's cinema verite or the theater of cruelty, it's not just a representation of cruelty. It is cruelty. We're actually seeing it being played out in real time. Um, a, another example of that, I think, um, would, would be the fact the man who, who hangs himself, if I'm not mistaken, it's the actor is Volker Spengler's lover. Bob Dorsey, which means that what Fassbinder is doing is that he is creating a scene very much like a sort of an SM, in the, the way that SM people would say he did, I like this kind of a scene. He enacts a scene where one lover watches the other suicide. Um, the, I'm haunted by the, the perambulation that the mother is made to make at the end. He also forces his mother not to approach the prostitute prostrate Elvira on the ground in the con in the in you know so he he uses his he's, he's okay mom you do that R prove that you had no empathy you're, you're gonna prove to Germany that you that, that you didn't love me um, so that's the, the one thing the, his use of his stars and to this extent he's very much like Warhol and his superstars in the factory and there's the same sense of blame that adheres to Fassbinder as did to Warhol he made Edie Sedgwick kill herself he you know and it's I don't really think that you make other people do those things and so I from the beginning don't um, agree with any possible line of inquiry that would hold Fassbinder responsible for anything around him nonetheless um, he floats that sense of his possible guilt around. Okay, this, the second thing, this is, I'll actually mingle in a couple of these here, is Lacan has this notion, I think, of the synthome, I think is how he, is, is the word, which is the opposite of a symbol. It's, um, I, I read it as a kind of, a, de, a, a kind of a manifestation that of idiotic enjoyment, I think he described. But I would use his notion of the synthome to describe in Fassbinder the way that, that aspects of the decor work against the allegories and the plot of the movies. Because Fassbinder makes it very hard for us to see what's really happening in the plot of the movie. We're filmed, we're, we're seeing the scene through a long hallway, for example, or we don't know the full story yet. Um, so I th what we, what's happening in a Fassbinder film is that we're given the spectacle of shiny surfaces that are kind of beautiful and kind of tacky, but that, that yes, they have an allegory or a symbol, a symbolic reading that's possible to associate with them, but on the most basic level, they resist the stories we tell of them. And I would just say that the shininess of the abattoir, the bathroom, and Elvira's strange apartment. There are very few symbolic vocabularies that could describe the shine of Elvira's surfaces, which were made to look at much longer than we are allowed to look at Elvira's face for her interiority. So the last thing that fits in with all this is that Fassbinder refuses us major star wattage in this film. Ingrid Coven is one of his big female stars, but she gets, she's always sort of off to the side in all of his films, almost as a kind of punishment. But there's no Hannah Sh Shigala, there's no Margie Carstensen, there's no central melodramatic woman. Instead, there's this abject, pitiful, but, um, <laughs> You know, th there is an absence at the center of the film um, where there should, where there could be Irm Herman, um, one one of these other women. Somebody want? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I I I don't know what uh, as a psychoanalyst I can bring to the discussion, 
but uh, I would say that just on the face of the movie, two things uh, were pretty uh, uh, impressive. One is the way he describes as a non uh, psychiatrist or psycho a psychoanalyst, the way he describes or has speaking a masochist. Mm -hmm. Everything she, he, she says, Elvira says, every way she behaves is exactly the way you would expect the masochist to behave. Uh, this way of being the victim, but yet not being fully aware that they are the victim because they've caused it. So everybody else has done something to them, hasn't understood them, hasn't given them what they wanted, has asked them that if you want me to love you, you have to be a girl, and he, she's gone and he's gone and, and has castrated himself. But everything is, is in a way, in a self-denying way, blamed on others, while at the same time the person remains uh, free of any wrongdoing and any guilt. Uh, the second thing that impressed me about the, again, the face of the movie is that I personally feel very, felt very agitated, and I've seen it now twice in the last four months, uh, at the beginning of the movie. The first uh, two-thirds of the movie make me feel restless and agitated. And then after he, uh, Elvira goes and cuts her hair, there is a certain calm that comes about. And this is the, the way it works with anybody who is going to commit suicide. Mm. After a period of agitation, where the depression dominates everything and they're agitated and angry and over little things they're screaming and yelling like in the uh, slaughterhouse scene, you can hear this shrill voice going stronger and stronger and stronger. And then at that point, it became, everything becomes, it has a certain strange kind of calmness to it. And I find that uh, uncanny that he would figure this out. And at that time, you also see what he portrays again very nicely in this film, which is typical of suicidal patients, is that they've decided to kill themselves. But there still is a little hope mm. that somebody would save them. And inevitably, nobody saves them. And those are the successful suicides. Now, so going back to what has been said, uh, I think some of the business about the interview uh, scene on the television, it must be an allusion to the fact that there are autobiographical elements in this movie. And I think he, uh, Armin, killed himself sometime at the end of May. And this movie is made very soon after that. So you know that you are dealing with somebody who is writing and is going to then film a story or a movie where his own mind is dealing with grief and mourning. And the way his guilt is very nicely seen in the, in, in the first part of the movie, and I think he has tremendous amount of guilt in addition to whatever else the, the people in Germany put on him, is through back and forth of identification. You can always think of is Elvira Armin or is Fassbinder Armin? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, is Elvira Armin or is, Ar Armin, is Fassbinder Elvira? Because there's this back and forth of who is who and who's done what to whom and how you are going to overcome what has done to you. And uh, so I think that's how he's working out his guilt, which is again typical. The identification when there is a great deal of ambivalence, and Fassbinder seems to me was overwhelmed with ambivalence. His rage comes out in all those scenes towards all the people. There's just rage everywhere. That ambivalence is also going to make it very hard to overcome the loss of someone. I believe I read someplace he was celebrating his birthday in Paris when Armin killed himself in Germany. And so, uh, that mental state is present, I think, in that agitation that we see in the beginning of the movie, because his own mind is agitated. Just to intrude one little thing, it <clears throat> may seem odd, but it seems to me very important. Armin Meyer was beautiful physically. 
he's in several fast movies. He looks like an angel. I mean, he's really extraordinarily beautiful. Um, Volkler Spengler may or may not be attractive by anyone's standards, but he's not given a lot of chance in this movie to look attractive. And Fassbinder was in Fox and his friends for a moment an erotic object cinematically, but generally the consensus is that he went downhill from there and was not attractive. So in terms of who Elvira is, um, Armin never can adhere to uh, a character who is not attractive, that there's a, there's a sort of a non-fit there. I, I was very interested in what you were saying, that one can actually see the film as a kind of case history. Mm -hmm. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed well, by what only you said. Up to a, yeah. Only but what, what considering you said, that what it's you said, speculative and up I, to a point. I, I would have, I, previously I would have said, no, 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 it's exactly not a case history. That makes it interesting that it's not a case history. You know, where this is not a film about exploitation, this is not a film about uh, uh, a clinical state, but I think you've convinced me that it's worth thinking about it because so much of uh, what we see and so many of the stages of his journey towards suicide seem, as you suggest, correspond to clinical uh, trajectories, uh, except, of course, that uh, uh, in the interview that we hear, uh, he specifically says, some people think I'm a masochist, but I don't think that's what's going on. Now, I don't know whether disavowal is part of the masochistic sim <laughs> symptom, so, so that, that doesn't get him out of it, but clearly it shows that, that Fassbinder is extremely aware of psychoanalysis in its clinical sense and can actually use it to build on some of those other layers we're beginning to talk about, which may or may not correspond to a clinical state, but which have these resonances <coughs> that are both historic, can be historically very specific, like I indicated about Frankfurt, there's a very specific history there, mm -hmm. but can also be allegorical in a wider sense, as Leo was suggesting, uh, that it actually takes aboard uh, really major issues that uh, uh, German filmmakers very rarely tackled so directly, uh, issues that, that West Germany is still confronted with. And so the, the sheer boldness of being able to conceive of a story that's both so personal, so intimate, so direct, and yet has these ripples, and do all that within six weeks uh, is just staggering. I mean, that we're talking about creativity, the creative mind, the ability to turn autobiography or life into art, it's quite extraordinary. And I think it's worth just pausing and thinking what that means about, about uh, uh, a creative person like Fassbinder. I, I just quickly say, uh, I, don't, uh, I, I wouldn't comment so much on the content of the movie because that is really his creativity that is doing it but he can't escape the mental state he's in. And I think that's inevitable in, at that time period that this was his mental state. Mm. Mm. As, as you know, there's always this issue about artists. You know, can you put them on the couch for their work? And is that something that's either no, you can't. useful or legitimate? I, I don't uh, think you can. Because us from the literature side or film side kind of pull a little bit against it, but uh, of course... Uh, My own rightly, feeling is uh, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not putting him on the couch in terms of the content of what he's saying, because that content I would only have to hear and rehear and rehear on the couch in order to be able to make sense of it. But I know that somebody who has just had the suicide of a lover and is writing something about it <coughs> or following it in such a close period of time has to be have that the, the state of mind created in them is inevitable. Unless he's so totally callous, he has absolutely no reaction. It's like, for me to hear that somebody died uh, in, Pe in uh, Beijing 15 minutes ago. Mm. But, it's not, but it's the not moment quite... it comes to me, then I have the mental I, state. I have to add another biographical fact, that, that it wasn't the first one who killed himself. With the yes, lovers. I know, I know. El Hedi Ben Salih. The star of um, Fear, Eats Fear Eats the Soul. Eats the soul. Yeah. The, the, uh, the hero of uh, Ali, yes. Uh. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to come back to stress something that uh, Thomas just said and maybe also come with a question for, for you, Ed, as well. Um, one autobiographical thing about myself, this was a total 
stroke of fortune or misfortune, I was in Germany between December of 1977 and, and the summer of 1979. And um, I mean, I have to say I didn't know, obviously had no idea of what was going on with Fassbinder except what, what I read in the newspaper. But I, I do uh, remember the mood in the country, which was very dark after the events of the fall of 1977, which, uh, I mean, there was a hijacking, uh, as you may remember, uh, some of the uh, terrorist members of the uh, Red Army uh, fraction were uh, committed suicide in jail, in prison, although it's thought for the longest time that they had been murdered. Uh, and certainly when Fassbinder made the film, uh, what had happened there was still very much up in the air. And he was very, as you said, he was very affected by this. And we see it in the uh, Jeremy and Autumn film. I have no doubt that he, that that's part of the, the work of sort of mourning and despair that informs this film uh, is also political. And we, I mean, we see him bringing in Pinochet and other, uh, other elements of what's happening in Germany is, is I think, one way of uh, him trying to put his mourning into perspective. Uh, one final thing I wanted to say about uh, Jews in German films in this period, um, the, um, the television uh, broadcast of the fairly awful miniseries Holocaust actually happened after this after this time I think in maybe in February of 1979 in any case after Fassbinder made the film and uh, and I was there for this uh, for the reaction in the press and um, on radio and TV uh, you would not believe how shocked many Germans were, even Germans who had lived through the Second World War, and how they expressed uh, the fact that they had forgotten these things or, or supposedly not known them. But there was a, a sort of a general confession going on in the German population during this period, which uh, makes Fassbinder almost look prophetic in the way that he's, he really dealt with this before uh, the floodgates of memory or, 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 or repression were opened. In, uh, the spring of well, as, as you know, as a consequence of uh, uh, the Holocaust series being shown in Germany, filmmakers actually decided, a number of new German cinema filmmakers decided to make films to put as it were, their side of the yeah. story. And you had yeah. Silberberg yeah. making, our, making yeah. our Hitler, you had uh, Edgar Reitz with the first Heimat uh, series, uh, you had Fassbinder himself, Marriage of Maria Brown was inspired by what was actually an initiative taken by Kluge, Alexander Kluge, who himself made a film called The Patriot. Right. All of those, Kluge had brought them together and said, look, you know, under this impact, we really need to open up ourselves. You know, we can't just let the Americans tell this story. We have to stand up and be counted. So some of the major films of the so-called New German Cinema are a direct consequence of the response to the broadcasting of, of the miniseries. Yeah. I wanted, um, Ed, I wanted to come back to you. One thing that I understood watching the film again is that Fassbinder, this interview that he gives uh, has been published to the, the protocol. Of, and uh, I was recognizing both the things that were said, and so I have a, a good sense of the general context. He is talking about his childhood and about the sort of uh, the very anti authoritarian childhood he had, that uh, by chance in part because his parents. Um, they, uh, they rented rooms to many people. Uh, his mother was ill and often uh, in, a, in a sanatorium. His father was a doctor and on rounds. So he, he sort of grew up, as he said, like a wildflower. He was able to do what he wanted. So he's talking, that's one thing that he's talking about in the interview. Uh, he also, in addition to the masochism comment, I think he says that uh, people think that, that my making all these films is a kind of mental illness. And, but you know, but I, I have to do it anyway. But I wanted to come back. The business about childhood is really fascinating to me because Fassbinder, in many of his films, and I've been rereading all of the interviews, comes back to this in the interviews. He, uh, on the one hand, he says, I had a wonderful childhood because I could do what I wanted to do. No, no adult uh, told me what to do. I, you know, I went to films every day. I read what I wanted to read. Uh, and, and yet, in, in this film, uh, we, we're confronted with uh, Salen Frieda, the one uh, the psychoanalyst supposed to stand in for a psychoanalyst in the short pants, uh, who, uh, who has had uh, no parents. He's, a, he's an orphan, so he can't be psychoanalyzed, supposedly. And I mean, this is, this is true, obviously, of, uh, or from that point, from that perspective, it's true of Elvira Ervin as well. And yet, but he's searching, and he goes back to try to find his childhood. 
the one I, I don't I, I wanted to, to see how you would respond to that the, the final uh, comment that seeing this in the film uh, I wanted to make a final comment about one thing it reminded me of in Berlin Alexander Plus which is the next really great project that Fassbinder will make uh, the novel uh, Alfred Dublin wrote the novel supposedly uh, in a kind of anti-Freudian stance he, he didn't give the main character any we, we know nothing about his parents we know nothing about his background and I was reading the other day that Fassbinder was very perturbed by this and was on the verge of inventing a father and mother for, for uh, Franz Biberkopf to, to, uh, so that he could insert a kind of Freudian framework into the film. He held back. I mean, he, there is a paternal and a maternal figure in the film. But I, I wondered, uh, did you sense to this, this searching for childhood to try to make sense of, of this horrible thing that has <coughs> happened uh, as an adult that, that's that that's an important uh, uh, fact. In I, the don't, film. I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, sp specifically, in terms of that scene, it is not clear to me if there isn't an element of justification there that because this has happened, because the first allusion to the six years is not directly connected to his parents, and then it becomes connected to the parents' divorce, and I don't know what the consequences. I know from what I've read that this was, uh, he was somewhat of a perverted, uh, very aggressive, very temperamental, one moment very aggressive, one moment very loving, pulling people, pushing people type of a guy. So that, that I have read. How accurate it is, I don't know. Going back to his childhood, apparently his mother uh, and father decided to put him uh, with his paternal uncle when he was three months of age for up to the age of one year. So he was separated for, from his mother for a good nine months of early life. Following that, they lived in the conditions that you described, somewhat chaotic. And uh, when he was uh, six years old, his father left. Now, I assume that the mother and the father, the father, by the way, was a doctor for prostitutes in the red light district. So, uh, and there's some, I, some uh, I guess there are rumors, I don't know, that some of the prostitutes came in and out of their house. Uh, so he was exposed to all this as a little boy, and then the father left, and I assume there were difficulties between mother and father before the father left. So, and then the mother was uh, in a sanatorium for a period of time. Again, by, before Fassbinder is 10 years old, all of these things have happened to him. Now, I don't know what ha those things happening to you do to you specifically, but I know they don't guarantee good mental health later. <laughs> <laughs> that these are bad things happening, and he had bad things happen to him as a child. The, the funny thing is that if you look at the whole generation of filmmakers, and you will find that of Fassbinder them. is not the only one, <laughs> that Werner Herzog is always talking about that he's father fatherless. Uh, Wim Wenders films are all about fatherless men. So it immediately becomes part of a generational issue and it obviously has a name to it, which is called The Fatherless Society, which is Michelik's book that everybody read and that was, as it were, part of what made that generation fatherless. Not, not, some, not so much that they didn't have fathers or difficult childhoods or divorced parents, but that there was a text, mm -hmm. a psychologic text that explained to them why they should feel the way they did about you know, passive-aggressive uh, behavior, uh, problems with the Oedipal uh, trajectory and identity and so on. So again, it's almost a kind of cliche by that to, to say this was a fatherless generation or that Fassbinder was fatherless. But we have a direct reference in the film to that historical situation because uh, Elvira Erwin's Weishaupt's mother has to disown the son because her m husband comes back from the war. So it's a whole generation of women who had to survive, make do, sometimes, you know, there are all these stories about prostitution as well, uh, in order to make a livelihood. And then, uh, in 56, 58, sometimes 10 years later, the husbands would come back from uh, 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 pr imprisonment in, in, in Russia. Fassbinder so, wasn't so, fatherless. So exactly. So, but, but the film actually uh, 
imposes on the character or gives the character a biography that, that is much more than an individual biography. It is indeed mm -hmm. one of those generalized biographies of West Germany uh, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and in fact, interestingly, Armin Meyer, the lover, uh, was a Lebensborn child, which means that he was the product of Nazi um, uh, mm -hmm. right, genetic experimentation. And his mother, in fact, did um, abandon him to a convent, bring him to a convent at the end of the war. So you have a kind of intermingling of biographies again. You have Fussbinder's mother, her body, uh, standing in for a kind of good mother for the character, but speaking of the bad mother at the same time, a kind of collapse of identities that you can see also in the way in which German-Jewish uh, relations are um, uh, configured. Uh, there is an earlier film, just a year or two earlier, uh, Fassbinder's film called Despair, mm -hmm. which was an adaptation of the Nabokov novella. And there is a film within the film, In Despair, that um, is the story of a group of gangsters in the 30s, and hence it also, there are connections to this film. Those gangsters um, are uh, chased by the police. The policeman's name is Brown, think Nazi period. The gangster's name is Silverman. But the two are brothers. Um, uh, Brown, uh, the policeman, goes into the house where Silverman is hiding out, and he wants to bring him, uh, uh, bring him out and, and ask him to surrender himself. At that point, Silverman says, um, he evokes an Oedipal scenario, and he says, well, mother always loved you more than she loved me. Uh, we don't know this because we don't see this, but sh and shortly thereafter, we see only one of them coming out. We think it's Brown because he's, by the way, they're twins, I should also say. <laughs> they're twins. We think it's Brown because he's wearing the policeman's uniform, but in fact, it's Silverman, and Silverman has killed Brown. Now, what fascinates Herman Herman, the character, main character of the film and Nabokov's novella, is that they're played by the same actor. And this sort of plays to um, a 30s film or early 20s film technology in which um, one actor will portray two characters with the line down the middle. So uh, think about that as a sort of collapsing and intermelding of identities, both in the same body, just as the same body, Fassbinder's biographical, actual mother, represents two different, or maybe three different stories. Thinking about um, Fassbinder and gay politics, which isn't really a very happy story, and it, it, it enters this, pic this picture, which is hardly a, a gay liberation uplift flick, um, in, in, to say the least, but Norris Fox and his friends, is the decision to have Elvira in bad drag rather than good drag, and it's, thinking about the masochism, it would, it's a very simple it's the road not taken. It's a, you know, it's a binary situation. You either do it right or you do it wrong. And he chooses, a, 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 it's a sort of queen mother drag at his best, I think, yeah. with the pearls. Yeah. And yeah. it's, um, I guess it's that kind of decision on Fassbinder's part. I think certain people at that time, gay liberationists at that time, would have seen this as a kind of suicidal gesture in terms of gay politics. Why, at the, if you are going to open up the expressive envelope this way to make a film about uh, a sexual outsider or vanguardist, why have him fail at it so spectacularly? Why be so unimaginative? Why not? There are other options of it. And the, the, he's, he's not interested and that it's sort of like that. Another thing that nobody has mentioned, but I felt in the room almost while we were watching the film, and I feel 
in myself when I watch it is boredom or rest, you said agitation, restlessness, Fassbinder's comfort, and I love boredom in films, and I think it's actually a, a productive experience, but, and it's part of what allowed him to make a film in six weeks is a kind of permission granted by, I think, the experimental films that he was influenced by to be non-narrative, meandering, slow, um, meditative, to have a rhythm, to, to, in fact, to give over the visual altogether to the, the, the voiceover text. And I, this connects to me a little bit with the issue of transcendence, which we were talking a little bit about beforehand, the notion that maybe the upward gaze in this film is a positing of some up there or elsewhere. And I was, the, the, what the boredom allow, or the static quality allows for, I think, is for a gaze to look, our, our gaze, but mostly the characters, to look off screen. And I, if you just track the uplifted gazes in this film, whether it's the fired guy drinking from his little schnapps bottle or whatever, looking up to the tower as one kind of, you know, monetary transcendence, um, to um, Elvira at her most pathetic, she's looking up like that, rather than the shame gaze downward. And Ingrid Coven's um, characteristic eye pattern seems to be to look toward other roles, other careers, other lovers off screen. So um, yeah, it, it just seems that in terms of talking about a film that as merely a glum or disaster prone, that the Schopenhauer, Nietzsche line, and even Sartre, that there is something about the gratuitous act in this film that may lead upward, even if it's going to Casablanca and undergoing whimsical, it's like a sort of jeed thing, really. It's just, I'm just going to go do this and change the world, change, decisively um, move upward. We were talking earlier about whether transcendence is made possible in this film, yeah. and I know there were varying thoughts about that, and you, Thomas, w uh, were talking about the Christological narrative that informs this, and you know these are stations on the, um, uh, right to the, on cross, the passion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to actually that intersects with what Wayne was yes, saying it's, uh, about the I upward mean, gaze. I'm, I'm, I don't <coughs> think I could quite <coughs> agree with you that uh, you know I, I I felt that it was a different mode from a Hollywood movie, obviously, but. I wouldn't have put bored as the term, right. uh, because I did think there was enough going on. In fact, there was more going on in mm -hmm. every image than I, than I could take in, mm -hmm. even though I thought I knew the film quite well. Uh, I mean, I noticed things, for instance, that I never noticed before, that it's in, in the slaughterhouse scene, mm -hmm. at the moment, at, as, as you see the water washing down the blood on the soundtrack, you have something about Christian having tried a car wash. Right, mm -hmm. and you know, and you suddenly say, "Well, is this, is this uh, uh, accidental, or are we now to make something of it? Is this transgressive? Is this blasphemous, even?" And and a lot of, you know, what we're talking about now, the, the Christological one, is also to do with, yeah, blasphemy. I mean, there there are things you know, to make Bergen Belson your your code word. <laughs> Uh, is in this context very transgressive. So I was constantly, I'm more than bored, it was actually the dread of what happens next or what comes next. Can, can it get worse? Is there, is there anything that we haven't seen yet? So it was more that sense yeah. that, that kept me sucked into the film. I mean, I would agree, not in a pleasure, necessary pleasurable way, but certainly I was kind of brought in and right. sucked in and felt myself gripped uh, maybe by a sadistic kind of intelligence gripping me, but I certainly felt that very strongly. Uh, and, and to what extent uh, this is something that we are indeed meant to experience. You said you couldn't feel that you loved this person. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, well, that's the very point of the film, mm -hmm. because here is a character trying to love others who are distinctly unlovable to say the least. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that particular relationship that the character has with 
the others, with his fellow human beings, with people who may or may not owe him a debt or whatever that relationship is, he opens himself up or she opens herself up into an unconditional love and he is rejected. And he's rejected in a way that we say, hang on a minute, can we bear this? Mm -hmm. Now, in a Christological sense, that would actually be one form of Christian love, is to love when you're not getting anything back. Mm -hmm rather than being in a bargain and saying, you love me and I love you, and you know, we try and go through life with that kind of secret pact, and hopefully it'll last, but it is a much, much more radical, much more decisive, much more dangerous, and in that sense transgressive love that's on offer, and it's the transgressive force of that love that makes the others go back. What? Who wants to be in that kind of a commitment? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And, and so, you know, that would be one way of, of going in what Brigitte was saying about the Christological dimension, apart from, you know, the iconography of sacrifice, um, slaughter, you know, pre-Christian. Uh, and indeed, there is a way of saying, what, are we, what kind of spirituality are we confronted with the film? There's the signs of Christianity, uh, uh, those, those beasts hanging from hooks and so on cannot but, and especially if we bring in other films of uh, Fassbinder like Berlin Alexanderplatz where that, the, the Christological references are much more explicit uh, about the slaughterhouse. If we think about uh, sacrifice, Abram, you know, Old Testament sacrifice, religious sacrifice in, in world religions generally, so it opens up those dimensions of of religiosity and, and, uh, and faith communities, but there's also a way of saying, is this a Christian view of Jewish faith? Is, is there a way in which we can tease out uh, this very problematic relationship that Christianity has had with Judaism, and, and that the whole notion of you know, the yearning for transcendence, but the absence of it is almost like uh, the Christian faith has the possibility of creating a transcendence where the Jewish worldview, according to the Christian, does not have that particular way of having the Messiah to take on or the love to, to operate in that particular redemptive way. I would just say about, to rephrase the boredom thing in terms of the Christological, that there, I would say rather the boredom of waiting for the Messiah. It's not boredom, it's simply a wait. Um, and that what I think that Fassbinder makes you do is sit and wait for things to become visible, for um, emotions to gel, um, for things to explain. I mean, that there's a sense of um, the, the person you need to have in the room to explain why you're in the room hasn't yet arrived yet. Um, that person's down the hall. Um, soon to arrive, and that's the feeling of Berlin Alexanderplatz. The that is certainly an exercise in a new kind of duration, um, with I think a religious and ecstatic dimension. And so, bore I don't really mean boredom, I mean um, one's experience of time is having to be renegotiated. To return to the idea of psychology in the film, I guess I wondered what people thought. I mean, it seems that he makes a very explicit use of it. There's a developmental narrative, and then there is the castration complex is, is made real in the film. Um, and I guess I wondered if anyone had any reflections on, on his use of that theme. And the second question I had had to do with in terms of love. Uh, it seemed to me that the female characters did actually respond to Ophir in a way that was very different from the male characters. And that they did even surprisingly, this a woman who had been so abandoned by her husband seemed to still love him. And this other woman, we don't know exactly the relationship. And, and then a third very tiny point. In, in the insistence on the spelling of sites, is, this, is, is he insisting on the Jewishness of the name, or is it, is it, is it just not clear? Arbitrary sign. You can't say A for Auschwitz. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's the T for tort, which doesn't in fact translate. And Armin Meyer, is that A? Is it E I? It's E I. E I. E I. I'm not. I, I, 
I think it does have to do with the Jewishness in some way. Certainly, uh, I mean, the name Meyer, for example, and EY would be Jewish. Uh, AI or EI would not, would not yeah. be normally, although, yeah. I mean, it's actually very difficult to know, but it must have something to do with that. It's a, you're thinking of safe words in SM and that the code words and that the, in a way what the AI signifies is that this is a linguistic system and that you need to function with, uh, with the word and with letters and with the minute differentiations therein to function in my world. Although well, those are constant. Uh, uh, there was a point that, uh, that you made uh, about you didn't feel that the, uh, the killing of the cattle was part of anything. And, and I found that one of the most mesmerizing parts to there. I, I, I literally couldn't hear what was saying. My attention was drawn to the, 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 the cattle struggling to live, to live, and then the blood gushing out and slowly dying, and then cutting them up. Yeah, no, I didn't say that the, that the killing, of, no, that is an overwhelming real signifier. It's there, but it's the, I meant the, sh the shiny surfaces in the film, one of which was the shininess of the slaughterhouse, um, has a way of simply being refraction itself or specularity itself. Obviously there we're being um, brutalized by the reality of what's happening, but I must say seeing it now two days in a row, um, there, it is possible just to look at it as paint. I'm not saying that makes me a good person, but the fact is, I thought seeing it today, I thought, you know, those murders happened a long time ago. It was no more real yesterday than today, and I'm going to choose today to look at it like paint. But my point yeah. was, yeah. I thought I kind of equated that to the death houses in, uh, with, with the Jews. You know, the cattle are going by, and the Jews are going by, and they're being uh, killed one by one mercy without any kind of mercy at all. And it so reminded me that scene with the cattle was the, was the same scene that, that people had in the late 30s and 40s when they had all those death houses. And, and Bergen Belson is kind of almost a little side reminder. Yeah. And it's real violence, too. It's not um, performed violence. It's real violence. There's real death. There's real blood. Um, interestingly, and this works, I think, in a kind of oh, Brechtian way, um, at the same time as we see those images and the camera pans for back and forth and aestheticizes them by those means, at the same, same time, we are hearing uh, the tape, probably, uh, um, of the interview with the journalist. Um, Elvira is playing Christoph, who is an actor, playing an important role, Tasso, in Goethe's Torquato Tasso, a very famous play of his classical period, in which um, uh, with, which actually had a kind of autobiographical dimension for Goethe. And so we have this, linguistically, we see, we have this sort of chain of, of um, signifiers, I suppose. Uh, and the collision between what we see, the real death bleeding, the flayed animals, and German idealist culture performed at various removes is sort of what, you know, you can't separate them here. And I read it as a critique. There's a gentleman there who's trying to. Yeah, about love. Uh, I felt, uh, you know, he was in a very bad situation until his uh, wife passed. And he helped, and he made, tried to make sure that his daughter did get killed. And he did all of this. That's when he really started to grow. He started to dress differently. He went to where he had to do His wine done better. And then he, he accomplished this. He accomplished this thing that his daughter would not get into a lot of trouble. He would get killed. And then when he saw, and he still might have had some love for this, for AI giants, I forget how what his name was. And uh, then he saw uh, this uh, billionaire with, with uh, the young girl, or the young woman, or the woman. And then he saw, well, because he probably still had some, some, something from the past, 
uh, with that man in his mind. So he cut his hair, and he decides he's going to go, uh, he's going to try and be part of that family at this point. Right? Now this was a wonderful thing. The daughter, and the daughter loved him. The daughter actually loved him. The wife, what well, was still a wife, she turns out to be not so hot. I mean, she couldn't even let him be there whether she loved him or not. Plus, he was frustrated. I mean, he was frustrated. That was a very sad thing. Otherwise, maybe he could have. But he was really growing. It seemed to me, you know, it was give and take what was going to happen to him. I thought maybe he might kill the guy with a scissors because he loved him, you know, before he went out there. And then it seemed a little not so real when suddenly he goes to this other guy who hadn't even been in the film and asks, I've got to see you and I've got to talk with you. You know, so the guy couldn't talk until too late. They know something. But, but no, no. there was love. There was love. This was not a situation where he didn't grow. I mean, it was getting tight. He could have... Stop Just have to say he wasn't really castrated. Well, the thing we have to remember, yeah. we're speaking of it, I mean, just yeah. for yes. many, you can gain weight for a role, you can do many things for a role, but you're not going to get castrated for a role. And that the fictiveness of this whole thing is that we know he didn't really get castrated for this part. So I think we can no, be I happy. <laughs> No, I know, I know, I know, but it's just, it's almost as if the sobriety of love, yeah. I wanted to talk about the psychologist and the question you asked her, because it did feel to me very much presented like a case history, even with that long uh, narrative of the early history. And it reminded me of a very important paper by Ferenczi about unwanted children. Ferenczi says in that paper that we're not born with the will to live. We have to get the will to live from being loved by our parents. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get that, we just, we, we basically don't really want someone anymore. And I thought this was such a clear case of that. He's been abandoned by his mother, and then he has a slight hope that he's going to get adopted by this other couple. And it seems like that's the, the only chance that's going to bring him back, and then he loses that. And from then on, there's just, there's, there's nothing in his life in this man. And I felt that the tone of the film, which was really, and it was certainly dreadful. It was hard to sit through the movie, but you know, we only had two hours of it. And I thought Fassbender was telling us, this is what it's like when you grow up in that situation, when you haven't had any love. There's no, there's no pleasure, there's no fun. It's sort of just a kind of desperate going through the motions, but nothing ever really happens. Oh, I just want to admit, wasn't, wasn't Fassbinder a fat in his stomach? Yeah. Yes, fat and a Yeah, because then our viewers can see I'm fat, I'm hard, you know. Uh, you know, and one of the points, I just want to make a short point about related to provenance, you know, when you think about, like, you think about Bergman, you, it's useful to think about Spinberg, obviously. You couldn't think about scenes from a marriage without thinking of Spinberg. And then obviously, you mentioned it when you think about, uh, when you think about uh, Fassbinder. It's almost you know, impossible not to think about Brecht. And then to think about one of the things that is a keynote of, of Brecht's dramaturgy is, that, is the referendum of Brecht, is the estrangement effect, which is, the, uh, which is, which is the, the elements which you see in the film. For instance, as we see the slaughter of the abattoir scene, and at the same time, you have the, you have the countervailing uh, kind of transcripts and narratives going on at the same time, we constantly frag, you know, prevent the willing suspension of disbelief. So getting back to Ed's point, and then the, when you don't have the willing suspension of disbelief, you don't have catharsis. And, and that's, there it seems to be, in some senses, the film, I mean, does it strike you, people? It, it has emotion, but is anti-cathartic. I mean, there's no element in which you, you as a viewer, nor can those in the film experience, except in, in one of instances, that element in which horrible things occur and you are able to expunge that horror. I, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right about the structure of the film, which is epic in that sense. You know, it's discontinuous, you know, separate scenes, you know, black in between, uh, fading out, and so on. So, so the, the, like, the, the, the dramatic structure clearly indebted to the direct. But I would say what goes on in the film is at least as much indebted to R2. Oh, yeah. and, and gives us, if you like, it's a film that, insofar as it relates to the theatre, and Briggs uh, may want to say some more about this, it's actually confronting two major 
theories of the theatre of the 20th century to major schools of how you actually uh, put something on stage. And in that sense, it, it would be very interesting to follow that through. Also, your references to, to Bergman, uh, I mean, there are many echoes uh, in uh, scenes from a marriage, actually, if I remember right, starts with uh, the husband packing and going away, you know, which is exactly what we see here. And, and, and the scene on the bed, the, the masturbation scene, is straight yeah. out of uh, the silence. So, so again, layering, layering, layering. But, but the point that you were making, that on the one hand, and it comes back to uh, what Wayne was saying as well, how do we actually enter the film? What are the, what are the terms of our engagement with the film? And I think you're right in saying there's a kind of Brechtian distanciation. But there's also a way of being drawn in uh, and aggressed in, in, in a way that, uh, that we refer, you know, relate to R2 and indeed uh, uh, Fassbinder made it very explicit there. The, the film that you mentioned, Despair, mm -hmm. is actually uh, dedicated, dedicated to R2. To R2. So I would say the, it's not exactly catharsis but the two credit moments when it says book mm -hmm. editing sound or all those things yes. by Fassbinder yes. is there's the signature's arrival I did this I made this mm -hmm. has a triumphant ring and also at the end when we have the date of the completion of the film I have arrived at the end the book is done this is a fact mm -hmm. it's Goethe's birthday by the way <laughs> even better, even better. You're right. Which I have from a German review oh, of the time, but it's, that's true. What we don't get um, when we watch it on TV, uh, DVD or on, on video is that the film actually ends with a, a number of unexposed frames. Mm -hmm. So you've got black <coughs> film stock and um, the, you could follow this through, but there's a sense in which the, the film texts um, various modes of engaging us, various uh, materialities, never come together in a unified body. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a sense in which the film itself, like the animals, is flayed. It's denied that kind of um, the organic wholeness that, for instance, a Goethean um, aesthetic would insist upon. I think it goes, goes further. The flaying is actually one of the key myths of the artist. Yes. If you remember um, Michelangelo, yes. uh, Sistine Chapel, there he is he, the artist himself, holding up his own skin. Mm -hmm. So that goes, what you're saying, the, triumph, the triumphalism of I did this, mm -hmm. fits it, mm -hmm. is coupled with the notion of the artist as self flayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, that what we talk about the autobiography, how autobiographical is it and how, how much is, does it convert some, you know, life into art, mm -hmm. you know, Fassbinder's actually signed it with precisely yeah. that issue. It makes this, the close-ups of the skin of Elvira more painful. The, the, the yeah. skin is really... But insofar as it's also the flaying of Marcius, mm -hmm. he, it's the artist who lost the battle the with battle Apollo. The battle with, uh, yes, with Pan, yeah. yeah. About the masochistic element of the film. Um, and I have one question for you, and then I want to make a comment. Um, the question is really if you could situate for us where the pleasure is in this victimization. Is it the humiliation? Is that what you're referring to? Um, well, there are many places for the pleasure. One of them is that the other guy is always the bad one. Something nice about the other guy always being the bad one. No. Right. It's, 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 it's the big the pleasure. Sure. Okay, um, and again, <laughs> 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 the other thing that I wanted to say was that um, it seems to me that the, mm, the strongest masochistic element lies in the viewing of the film. That masochism really does make of the viewer, I agree with you 100%, it's extraordinarily boring in the sense that there are many novels that, that I don't like reading, but I'm thrilled to have read and then enjoy teaching um, or writing about. But it doesn't mean that they didn't bore me in the sense as I read them. But I would never have gotten up and walked out of this film um, because there is, I mean, why do we stay and watch this film? 
it, it's, a, it's a torture, but at the same time, there's a tremendous pleasure in this. So I really think that he puts the masochism in us. I mean, by the way, why I watched the film is I knew we were going to have the discussion. Otherwise, I tell you, yeah. I would have walked out. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's been trying to get a bit of word in because they brought some kind of pleasure from this film, but it is a terrible thing. I'll try to forget a little bit. Oh, there's four of them. I think it's all right. Actually, it's really good. I think it's all right. I think it's all right. I take no credit for it. But Wayne mentioned it as well. So, uh, I, and it having to do with the degree to which the film is, is a conscious refusal of analysis, uh, isolated in the moment of the quasi-analyst in his boxing shorts saying that he couldn't be analyzed because he had no parents. Um, Schopenhauer plays, whose relation to Freud is that of a mentor, uh, plays a very extraordinary role in this film. The mother, Sister Goodwin, mm -hmm. is reading Schopenhauer. Uh, and uh, it's an it must be a, a truncated uh, world as well of a, an idea, but it's a, because it's a very skinny book. Uh, but she is reading Schopenhauer. And earlier, uh, we hear about the, 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 the um, world as well, world as representation, um, more such as little, little gobbets from Schopenhauer. And then, of course, the suicide in the office. This is more, I think, in an album of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, as, as, as Wayne was suggesting. But again, he says, it's not life I reject. Um, it's the framework of life in which I find myself. And, and, and you know, a very, you know, sort of a very interesting uh, moment in the film and an interesting reflection on, you know, the, well, the, the existential question, why not commit suicide and so on, which we associate more with, 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 with starting from Camus. But Schopenhauer seems to play a particularly prominent role and I wonder if it can't be, if it can't be understood as uh, Fassbender saying, perhaps in denial, no, 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 it's not Freud I'm interested in here. It's Schopenhauer and the problem that there is no reality, uh, but that our representations and the way in which we exert our will representing uh, are so inadequate. Um, you know, and I'm not interested in Freud because Freud takes it that there's a repressed reality. And I'm not sure what I know the rest repressed reality to be. Uh, I'm more interested in the, in the inadequacy of our representations. I just wanted to make a comment on that. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to them. I'd, I'd like the gentleman there has been really trying very hard to get to No, but I, I have, but is it appropriate for you to follow up? Well, I could just very briefly say, I would say Paul is absolutely right, but it's, it, it's not that... Um, uh, Fassbender rejects Freud in favor of, uh, what did you say, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, is that he rejects Freud in favor of Deleuze Guattari. This film is about uh, the Deleuze Guattarian version of identity, multiplicity, fragmentation, flaying, uh, dispersal, uh, and, and so they're a very contemporary, at least at the time, you know, Anti-Oedipus was exactly published at that time and read and uh, discussed very intensively. So, so I think you're absolutely right with a, with a kind of dialogue between Schopenhauer and Nietzsche going on, uh, but uh, or put forward by nearly 100 years uh, towards, towards the time when the film was actually made. Sorry, that was just a little. Well, following up on the earlier comments made by uh, this gentleman who called attention to the family scene where he comes upon his wife and his daughter who were eating after he's really put himself back into his male role. And I would ask whether or not anybody thinks that in some way that was the climactic scene in the movie. The movie begins with sort of presenting him yearning for love. So that yearning, which was articulated as part of it, and the search for love is very much there. And as the movie moves along, uh, there are various transitions, but it seems to me a very strong transition when he cuts his hair, he puts on male clothes, and he goes back to his family. Now, what he's yearning for at that point and asking for is really impossible from a variety of points of view. One, because he's been castrated. Two, because he's got his own issues of his sexuality as to who he might really be. But it seems what's presented there, and I thought it was very, very poignant, is that, and maybe whether or not 
was this in fact by, by, by his mind, again given who he was in his whole biography, is that in some uh, utopian but unreachable sense, it's in that nuclear family where love really lies. Well, but that's all a response to, to his walking in on Zola and Zeitz asleep, and that's when he goes and cuts his hair and sets into motion all that other stuff. I, I think what's going on is actually very complex, because I, we do feel that this would be a wonderful solution. But we're also very aware that is not a solution. It's too late, but not only too late, but it was never a possibility. Right. And, and so, and so what, what we get is, is, a, is a kind of temporary relief. We think we uh, straight, heterosexual, white, middle class, think, wow, wouldn't it be great if that could be it? But Fassbinder sets us up for it right. and then pulls the rock from under it. Because, you know, this character that we can't get into without being now uh, making a joke about it, um, he is of course very difficult because he has no sexual identity. One of the most difficult things to come to grips with is somebody who constantly changes sexual, sexual identity or, or orientation. It's okay, somebody who's gay, uh, but the film says no, he wasn't gay. Is he a transsexual? If he is, he botches the job. So constantly through the film, we need to find somebody whose sexual identity goes with his or her body. And we're not given it until the point, cuts off his hair, puts on a tie and a suit, <laughs> and, and then walks into the family. And, and we want to it succeed, but we know the logic of the film right. denies but, it. But beyond the issue of sexuality, you also have to go back to his, his early childhood, when he was lacking the kind of love that he would have needed for the family, and that's very clearly articulated by the nun and his mother, as, as it were, talking about what his childhood was like. That, that's that why the film is so tough to take, because right. uh, as psychoanalysts, you may want to say, well, if I only had, had this character on my couch in my office, I, could have, I really could have done something for him. But the film says, I'm not no, sure about no, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say that it was the turning point because it's the moment, I agree with the gentleman over here, where he actually has love but rejects it because the daughter genuinely loves the yes. father. It's true they can't live together, right. that's true. And yet, at that moment, when someone offers it and it seems to be represented as being genuine, he turns away. Yeah, but it was also right at that point that things go down, really go downhill, as it were, and you know that suicide is inevitable after that. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, as I said before, suicide was inevitable when that decision was made to cut the hair. I agree, and go yeah, and go okay. uh, Because he knew that wasn't working. He knew that wouldn't work. And also the way he walks out and he's holding his breasts, I noticed that he, he kind of was touching his breasts as he was walking in that suit. Mm -hmm. And his, his, his gait yeah. is so distinctive through the entire movie. I mean, in the opening scene where he's getting beaten up, he's like the cows in the slaughterhouse scene, the way he staggers off and then crawls into the bush. And then at the end, after he cuts his hair, he's still got that sort of lindsay gait. There's nothing right about that. It's all wrong. It just, just, looks, it, it, it just yeah, doesn't it, look. Cancer right. floods. Yeah. <laughs> and he gains more pride. He gains more pride. It's similar to the guy that kills himself. He, as, the, as the movie goes on, he gains more pride in himself. He dresses differently. He does all the things. Yes, that was a solution. Uh, I'm just wondering, since I found the film to be particularly painful to watch. Uh, how well did it do at the box office? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could not have been a particularly popular. Always better. <laughs> Always better in this country than in Germany, of course. Pardon me? Always better in this country than in Germany. Um, Fassbinder became very popular in this country in the sort of art cinema circuit and is studied at universities, of course. And, uh, and actually showed his films at the New York Film Festival. So he uh, and became very popular in France, um, but Germany, which is cinematically backward, took a long time to, to find him interesting. It's true that this is, but you know, does one always have to, if one reads a novel or looks at a painting, 
The emotions that those texts evoke aren't always pleasurable, but they can be interesting. But and painful. Oh, well, maybe painful. I don't know how painful. If you are, yes, you feel empathy, but if you see it as many you know, times as someone studying it would see it, you approach it as a text and differently. So I think, you know, I mean, I think we have this feeling about movies that they should be there for our pleasure, various kinds of pleasure, not just simple pleasure, but that somehow they should do this for us. But that's not, look at Bunuel. A $12 Bunuel a ticket, or, I think. <laughs> I think it's also, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, yes. The way I ask you this, it seems that the movie represents uh, Problems about searching one's identity. Am I a murderer or am I not a murderer? Why did he bring that whole horrible scene with those dying enemies into the movie? Meaning to say we all are murderers. I'm not the only one. I also kill. Everybody kills. It is, has something to do with his wish to make some sort of peace with his inner self. Am I part of a murdering country? Or is everybody like this? And I maybe I will find an excuse. And he cannot find a solution. Even the suicide is a form of not being able to find a solution for his enormous feeling of guilt. Mm -hmm. Hence the masochistic aspect of that film for Fassbender and the gross body which he exposes his own gross body and other and he con he connects his body with that of the dying animals as well as the the bodies of Jews killed in the Holocaust so that's another moment in which the two bodies are stand in for the same but for Fassbender Elvira as a character is talking about the way the uh, when she was a butcher, and remember she's both butcher and beast, when she was a butcher, um, she felt the animals wanted to be killed, that there was a kind of ecstasy about that and that they were finding her salvation, their salvation. But the film relentlessly is relentlessly material, and transcendence is never at an issue. It's relentlessly material, and whenever, in my reading anyway, and whenever there is even a hint of that, it's undercut by the real. So, yeah, it, yes, I think it is exactly as you say. The record being stuck is also a, a metaphor of what, what, you know, what they were trying to uh, bring out in the movie. It's also, just incidentally, in terms of the casting, the daughter in, uh, the daughter played Fassbinder in another, Eva Mattis, correct? Yes. I don't know what to make of it, but it seems to, oh, it seems to say that cross-dressing mm -hmm is salvation. Somehow, if the redemptive figure in this movie in the one place of love is the daughter who was elsewhere Fassbinder, that after that may death. be the, after, after his death? death. Oh, yeah. darn it. Well, that I believe in proleptic readings. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay.